Hello, my name is Mary Ann Rockwell. I'm a librarian at Saratoga Springs Public Library. And tonight we have Saratoga artist Daisha Devon Harris uh, presenting I've Got a Home, her series of photographs inspired by her hometown. Um, this is part of the Saratoga Reads program series for which the chosen book this year is Saratoga Soul Branville Blues by our own Saratoga native, Carol Daggs. You can find out more about Saratoga Reads at sspl.org. And now I'm pleased to present Daisha Devon Harris, a Saratoga Springs artist and photographer who counts as her earliest mentor, her great uncle, Joseph Daniels, a local self-taught master painter. Daisha has Numer won numerous awards. Uh, she holds a BFA in studio art from the College of St. Rose and an MFA in visual art from the University at Buffalo. She's a member of various organizations and plays an active role um, in her community as a youth mentor, social activist, and cultural history preservationist. The gentrification of her hometown and its effects on the local Black community has played a major role in both her advocacy and artwork. Most recently, Ms. Harris has been an NFOCO Fellowship winner and an MDOCS Storytellers Institute Fellow. She has had residencies at the Center for Photography at Woodstock, the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology in Oregon, at the studios of Key West and at the Yaddo Artist Colony. She has also been an Aaron Siskind Foundation Individual Photographer's Fellowship Awardee and a NYSCA Artist Fellow in Photography, as well as being named one of the Royal Photographic Society's 100 heroines. Daisha will show um, her show her and discuss her work first, after which there will be a question and answer period. Welcome, Daisha. All right. Um, so this is fun for me because um, I don't normally talk to a, a local crowd when I give artist talks. So I can't be really specific about, you know, um, Congress Street Plaza and people know what I'm talking about. So I am excited to have this uh, sort of in insider conversation with you all. And I'm just going to start by saying um, that I was born and raised in Saratoga Springs. I'm a fifth generation Saratogian. And the reason I mention this is because much of my inspiration stems from my family's roots here, my community and the landscape of my home region. For those of you who don't know, um, but probably all of you do, the name Saratoga is an adaptation of a word from the Mohawk language, meaning the hillside country of the quiet river. And normally when I do artist talks, I like to show this picture um, so that people not familiar with the area can get a little visual perspective and show how the city is cradled by the beautiful Adirondack landscape. I also usually share the city's motto, as you all know, health, history, and horses, to point out the popular narrative that is told about this city. Um, in my lifetime, the Black population has decreased by half. Let that sink in. I'm not that old and Saratoga Springs has lost half of its black population. Saratoga is now 93% white, which is not accidental or, or a coincidence. The thing about Saratoga's popular history and this mir mirrors our, oops, hold on, sorry. This mirrors our national and historic memory is it doesn't include any reference to its vibrant communities of color or its legendary black residents and visitors. This is the history that has always interested me. These important exclusions include people like Solomon Northrup, 
George Crumb, Emma Waite, a Victorian era black domestic worker who left behind a diary full of the complexities of everyday life and visitors like freedom fighters, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. Not to mention the hundreds, if not thousands of unacknowledged enslaved people who accompanied their Southern owners to Saratoga seasonally for almost 40 additional years after New York State had abolished slavery. These were the stories that I wanted to investigate, share, and have included in our historic, in our collective memory. And so I realized early on that if I wanted these topics addressed, I was going to have to do it myself. Um, so I'm having a little challenge. I have to go back and forth with this mouse. It's not working like, like we anticipated. Um, yeah, the, when I click this, it goes over to the, the notes instead of the slideshow. <laughs> I never, <laughs> the gallery. Okay. <coughs> Okay, we got the gallery. I apologize for these technical difficulties. This is the first time I'm operating the slides and using the notes at the same time. Um, so, okay, so you're doing, okay. Um, okay, yeah, so, so the desire to know and address incomplete histories whether it be familial or that of the greater African diaspora has always driven my artwork and thinking about visual representation in relation to race has been a huge part of the journey. This family photo represents a lot of what I think about when I'm making art. This is a portion of my paternal family. It includes my great -gram my grandmother, Eleanor, my great grandmother, Harriet, and my great-great-grandmother Daisy, and a host of my great aunts and uncles. Out of all this greatness, only one person remains here on this yeah. earth, and that is my great-uncle Joey, my first art mentor. But not only are the people gone, the building is gone too. It's Mount Olivet Baptist Church, the longest running historically black Baptist church in Saratoga, and not surprisingly, an active participant in the civil rights movement. The church building, building was taken by the Urban Renewal Agency in 1966. The reason I mention this date is because it's important to locate this event in, the, in history to understand the motives behind the displacement. Mount Olivet was involved with the National Civil Rights Movement and supported the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, more con commonly known as SCLC whose goal was ending all forms of segregation and continuing and the continuing struggle for human rights. Even the street, William Street, which was populated mostly by black families, does not exist today. A powerful effort was made to erase this community and this history. So this photo is the only memory, the only evidence I have that these people, that this place, that this moment existed together. The only thing I ever wanted to be was an artist. My earliest mentor is my great uncle, Joseph Daniels, pictured here, a proud self-taught artist and accomplished master painter. He had a beautiful home on Jefferson Street, one that had previously belonged to my great grandmother, Harriet. He remodeled it himself and the hole downstairs was a gallery of his artwork. He had his own studio, which was actually just an upstairs bedroom, but nonetheless, his own space. It was an amazing place to be as a child. Painting lessons at his house would consist of him patiently teaching me watercolor techniques, telling me family history, and talking to me about politics. It made no difference that I was only eight years old. He made me feel so seen and capable. Since the only real working artist I knew growing up was my uncle, I couldn't understand why at school the only artists included in the textbooks were white men and a sprinkle of women here and there. That stuck with me, knowing that black people and other people of color existed in every capacity that white people did, and I wondered why had they been excluded. This is one of my earliest photos, and it's one of my favorites. I always like to show this, 
Uh, it's a portrait of my dad that I took when I was six or seven. The photo was taken at a boat show in Lake George, New York. And as most of you know, the scenery in the Adirondacks is especially amazing in the fall. I like to show this photo because it embodies a lot of the concepts I explore in my contemporary work. Seasonality, the landscape, portraiture, family, history, and memory. And also as an encouragement for the parents out there to support your kids' interests because it makes a difference. Both in my life and my work, my greatest inspiration above all is my parents who always fostered my creativity and fueled my interest in stories and history. They also taught me in both words and actions, the importance of community. Whether it was delivering some fresh caught fish to our neighbors or spending a little time with visiting an elder who didn't have relatives of their own. My parents were always reaching out in a way that I understood as a responsibility and an act of love, not as charity. The concern, compassion, and responsibility they showed for their neighbors is the same characteristics I see in some of my favorite artists, writers, and activists. People like Gordon Parks, James Van Der Zee, Dr. Deborah Willis, and W.E.B. Du Bois, to name a few. My own community work includes my art practice, archiving and preserving our local Black history, social activism, and traditional community care. As I mentioned, my family legacy in Saratoga begins with my paternal great-great-grandmother, Daisy Clark Evans, who moved to Saratoga from Buffalo Springs, Virginia in 1922. The family had come to the spa city on vacation and liked it so much they decided to stay. I like to point this out because what little black history in Saratoga is known or shared often assumes that most black community members came here for work. But just like the millions of white tourists, black people came to Saratoga for leisure and pleasure as well. My grandmother Daisy was a member of the Mount Olivet Baptist Church and the Spanish War Veterans Auxiliary. Her daughter, my grandmother Harriet, was, always, was also a member of Mount Olivet Baptist Church. And after the William Street Sanctuary was purchased by the Urban Renewal Agency in 1966, she sold the church the land, the, the land for the present building located on the corner of Crescent and Jefferson Street, which is where myself and my family still attend today. My great grandmother, in addition to the church plot, owned, uh, sorry, owned a handful of properties on the west and south sides of Saratoga in which her and her children lived. Not one of the properties remains in the family today. The house where my father and his siblings grew up is no longer standing, as is true for many of the previous generation of black and brown Saratogians who grew up here. I discovered this time and time again while working on various projects and talking to people about their family history. This is a page from the 1965 Urban Renewal pamphlet. The pamphlet objectives list off street parking, street widening, improved traffic in the most congested part of the city, and improvement of the tax base by replacing blighted declining areas with new commercial uses and new middle income housing. Notice the bottom line of the paragraph states, it is for the benefit of all residents in Saratoga Springs. Yet mass displacement of the majority black residents ensued. The language used to describe the future of Saratoga are attractive, beautiful, new, and the words to describe the present neighborhood are inadequate, unattractive, and intolerable. Take a look at the 1965 project area. The purple stars are just some of the specific homes and places mentioned by community members in my photographs. The highlighted area is Congress Plaza. That's what replaced these people's homes. I mean, CVS is convenient and I like Purdy's and Peking Walk and UPS as much as the next person but I think it's an epic stretch of the imagination to consider that this use of space is beautiful or even utilized well. 
these federally funded urban renewal projects were systemically used to destabilize black communities all over the country. When I started thinking about creating my series, I've Got a Home, I had several main ideas written down. I really wanted to emphasize and claim the historical aspect, highlight our roots here in this place, and at the same, and at the same time, point out that many of the landmarks you see in the vintage photographs are not still in existence. I also wanted to emphasize that although our numbers are small, we are still very much present and the evidence of our contributions is still visible for those who know how to look. And lastly, I wanted to encourage people to actively consider what we, the larger community can do to maintain not just our historic structures, but also Saratoga's culture, diversity and richness. So I started off by photographing James Gant because he is a huge inspiration to me. We had a long talk about things that were going on in Saratoga and also the political climate in our country. We looked through his photo album and talked about the things that have changed over the years. I took suggestions of him, from him, of other people he thought I should include in the project. And I went from there. The next person on my list was Roland Yarborough. Another one of the people I spoke about earlier whose childhood home was demolished in urban renewal. His home on Patterson Street is right behind the Congress Street Plaza. I also asked each contributor to let me borrow a family photo that was specific to Saratoga while jotting down some of their stories, exclamations, and comments about the pictures. With these accounts fresh in mind, I created a text for each piece that was reminiscent of a lyric from a song or a line from a story. The vintage transparency on glass casts a shadow on the wall. It is a memory, evidence of our presence, but like many of the spaces and structures illustrated in the photos they are, that are no longer in, in existence, it is fragile and prone to erasure. The title, I've Got a Home, is a segment of a line from a spiritual, I've Got a Home in That Rock. It's meant to be a passionate statement. The very fabric of our nation is woven with the alluring thread of the American dream, the dream and promise of home ownership. I've Got a Home is not just about the physical structure, but a state of mind, to be truly free and safe in a place, in spirit and in truth. This is what W.E.B. Du Bois speaks of in his 1903 publication, The Souls of Black Folks, when he states, the freedman has not yet found freedom in his promised land. I think it's valuable to mention that I made this series in, 2000, in 2011, after living away for about five years, going to grad school and then living in San Francisco for a couple years. The changes that occurred in less than five years was substantial, and I felt such an overwhelming sense of urgency when I came home to continue preserving and celebrating our shrinking community. The people in these photographs are important. Their families and history is important. In part, my artwork will always be a tribute to my father, his memory, heritage, and history. It is so important to me to acknowledge losses never counted, as well as honor the living. My family and extended community are the most important people in my life, and I revere them, but they're not acknowledged, uplifted, celebrated, or even protected in everyday American life. And that is why I make this work. I believe our history, I believe that in our history lies the answers to the way forward. And I hope by centering tenderness and not forgetting those past and gone, we can move toward an equitable and just society. I want to acknowledge um, in, in this body of work, those that are passed on before we look um, a little more closely at some of the photographs and um, I have some detail shots for you to look at as well. And then we can have a conversation. Um, I'm gonna say the names of those in the series um, who have moved on since I've uh, took, taken their photograph. Uh, Harriet Watson, 
Cecil Myrie, Roy Washington, Erlene Youngblood, Roland Yarborough, and not pictured in this series, but a recent enormous loss is the passing of Carol Dagg's mother, Ruth Daggs. Um, so I'm going to flip through. I have included way more slides than is necessary for um, an hour chunk of time, but I'm gonna uh, keep the slides going and I'd like to open up the floor first to anybody who is in these photographs or a family member of uh, the people in the photographs to comment, to ask a question, to make a statement. Um, is there anybody who'd like to speak? How do I do this? So, so what people can do is to go to the the rightmost reactions down at the bottom, there's a little toolbar, go to reactions and then click that. And then you can click on the raise hand and we can, um, we'll see if that works. Shall we try that? Um, so the people, you said first, the people who have been in the photograph, Stacia? Yeah, or their family members. Family members. So and if no Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I'm raising my hand verbally. Okay, good. Perfect. <laughs> Hi. Um, Deja, these photos, the narrative, this is so lovely. Um, the picture in particular in front of the church, I wondered if there's any um, more you could share about that, any more detail, sort of like what year is that-ish or anything else. I'm curious about that photo. Um, let me go, how do I go back to that photo? So, um, which is not characteristic, characteristic of me. I did not write, <laughs> include the date of that photo <laughs> where I could see it, but, um, obviously it is pre 1966, which is when the building was taken. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm going to guess by the dress, um, and by the age, I would say of, um, uncle Joey that it's in the fifties. Mm. I don't know what, what exact age. Yeah. But. He maybe does look, yeah. Like eight or nine or something like that. Yeah. Oh, I think this photo is so wonderful showing the, clothing, um, all the different faces. I think it's really wonderful. So that was not such an amazing question, but I do thank you for going back there and answering it. Um, family member photo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really always love to show this photo because, you know, it, it sets up, um, it sets up my home here in Saratoga, th this photo is why I I'm here. Um, and I just love that um, our great, great grandmother Daisy came here for vacation and was like, I love it, I'm staying. Um, Cause you don't always hear that story when it comes to us. Yeah. Uh, um, Aisha, there yes. are some things in the chat box. Uh, can I? Uh, shall I read them? Sure. So Miriam, to, Miriam says, you're so sweet. Good to see you. Is there a way for folks to still join the conversation? Okay. Uh, okay. And then I have a few colleagues that would like to join. That's okay. If they have the, if you have the link to share with them, that's fine. That's also Miriam. And, and just, um, Daniels to everyone. These photos are so fantastic as is the narrative. Thank you, Daisha. So I just thought I ought to read what was in the chat box there. Is there anyone else who would like to share? And Miriam says she loves the transparencies. I'd love to hear from um, Aunt Donna. She wants to 
comment. Okay. Is it even Donna, though I just put her on the spot. <laughs> is it Donna G? Yes. I'm going to unmute her. Donna G is the spouse of Uncle James, um, James Gant. Okay. So Donna, um, can you go down to the little microphone in the left? Oh, I think you're, I think she's good. She can, she can speak now. <laughs> Hi, Daisha. Hi, Adana. I think it's just so beautiful just seeing the pictures and being yes. with you. And when you do the shows, I enjoyed the one at the um, airport also. That was nice. Keep up the good work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt Donna. I, oh. I was going to see if you wanted to talk a little bit about when... Um, when we were looking through all of your years and Uncle James's uh, family albums, and in what what was that like? Like going through the photos and looking and remembering um, for what photo we were going to choose to to use for this project. Well, just going through and with you and your husband being over here, it was just so uplifting and. I don't know, Daisha. Everything was just so beautiful. You bring in tears to my eyes. <laughs> oh, keep up the good work, huh? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, I want to zoom in and show you a little bit closer. I know it's hard to see um, the, the smaller vintage um, photographs, but uh, this is Sean Marie Stevens, and um, this is a detail, closer up shot of the vintage photograph that accompanies um, her portrait. And it's a portrait of her dad as a child sitting on the top of a beautiful old car right out front of Mount Olivet Baptist Church again um, when it was on the west side um, before urban renewal. And um, her dad is such an important person to her. He um, was in the choir and was musical. And if anybody knows Sean Stevens, she has a beautiful voice um, and uh, plays the piano beautifully and the drums. She's just uh, an incredible musician. So all of the those pieces are, are embodied in, in that photograph that accompanies her portrait. Um, there is something in the chat box, a new comment. Um, uh, so Lisa says she, she doesn't want to unmute, but she loved what you said about tenderness. That really comes through in your portraits. Can you speak to that? Um, mm. Asia? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, when you go to art school, well, I don't know if you know, but when I went to art school, <laughs> uh, it's, um, you learn a lot of uh, critical theory and um, what sometimes we like to say highfalutin language. And, um, you know, you learn kind of what is called the game of the academic game of the fine art world. And I think a lot of times you lose um, the reason that you do the work um, when you're talking to people uh, in order to sound smart or educated. And it, for me, it, it comes all back to that. Um, I love these people. I love my community. I want them to be safe and celebrated and um, respected and honored. Um, and so for me, really, it, it comes down to tenderness, uh, family love, and, um, and that's why I love to do it. And that's why it's so important to me. Great. Thank you. Um, um, there's another comment that I'd like to read. Uh, Daisha, your photographic presentation is beautifully rendered along with the narratives and historical context. Thank you for instilling awareness through documenting and sharing this important personal and community legacy. It's not a question, but if, are Thank there any? You. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, in the between time, I'm gonna show you another photograph. This is Sheila Terrell Griffin. 
and I'm going to show you, I don't, if you all can see, can you see behind her, um, on her right, there's, um, some like porcelain dolls on her dresser. I'm going to then zoom in to the, the vintage photograph, which is Sheila, um, and a doll, uh, uh, something, uh, um, a narrative that stayed with her throughout her life. She loves dolls, but she's sitting in the unfinished door frame of the home that her father built um, over on the south side um, near the Dags um, family farm. And I just love, I, I love that you see the foundation, that the physical foundation of the house in the background and um, and that she's in a doorway. I always love um, kind of the symbolism that doorways have, um, an entrance, a, pre a precipice. And um, I just think it's, you know, that this, this house also is, is not in her family line anymore. So um, this photograph is really special to her. Hi, Steven, Tyson, I see you. I know you have something to ask or say. Oh, that was my comment right there. Uh about that <laughs> legacy and, and beautiful work. It's just tremendous what you've uh, contributed. So delighted to see your work that you're creating here is important to our community. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Steven. Does anybody have any questions about um, the process? I, usually that's like the number one thing, but I kind of love answering um, more um, history oriented questions. So I, I do like the direction that you guys are going. I can pipe in, it's Camille Daniels here with another question, which is I you shared many pieces of information. I'm wondering if there is some outlier piece of information that doesn't fit with the narrative or, or just if there's something else that you feel you discovered that you want to share about that maybe doesn't have a photo to go with it, for example, just something that you may have come across while you were putting together this project. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I've only recently, um, and by recently, I, I mean, like, in the past few years, seen that urban renewal pamphlet, which makes me sick to my stomach. <laughs> if you can actually, um, this is an advertisement for the Saratoga Room, because they have a wealth of um, information and amazing historical ephemera in there. And that pamphlet is... Uh, in the Saratoga room. But um, until I saw that, I never had seen a, a blueprint or a map, a uh, mapping of the actual urban renewal projects. And when I, to see that and to see, you know, when, when I said, um, you know, his, the, he remembers the home, um, his home on Patterson street was never paved. I'd never seen Patterson Street. So, you know, I'm imagining this like you all are imagining it because I'm sure many of you have never seen it either. But when I saw that map and I saw how many of the places, you know, I don't know these places. So I wasn't in, um, in any way leading people to say, you know, anything specific about any specific area. But when I saw that map and realized how many of those places were in one spot and were mentioned specifically by name, it just made the loss uh, of, of that area, of those people's homes, of that community um, so much greater and, and so much more real. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing about that. Yeah, it's like the number of times my mother has talked about Cowan Street. It's like mm -hmm. I have this vision of it from all the stories that she would tell um, about living there and what it was like. And, and uh, so, yeah, I can really relate to what you're saying. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, and I think that um, I'm sure that it's evident, but um, always good to just reiterate, um, you know, these these systems of, of erasure um, that are fueled by institutional racism, they, they have different names. Um, they're, they're always the same. They operate a little bit different, but they always have the same concept. And, um, you know, our parents witnessed, um, mine and Camille's parents witnessed urban renewal, but we, we've been witnessing uh, gentrification in Saratoga um, for you know, the past 20-ish um, years. And all of these things do the same thing in that they disrupt and disband communities. Um, that way you are breaking up any unity that might happen. You're separating people so that it's harder to um, mobilize and, and to get together and get things done. And it's not, it's not accidental, um, it's by design. And so I always um, you know, wanna encourage people um, to, to speak up about it. Um, you know, a, a new, PUD, which is what Saratoga is littered with now, that's um, short for planned unit development, um, in my opinion, is not beautiful than um, a Victorian structure that needs some preservation, um, um, as well as obviously the family that owns that uh, Victorian structure that needs some preservation. So we need to do uh, a much more active and better job at preserving um, our historic structures, but also the, the people who made Saratoga what it is. Daisha, there's a message from TR. I don't know who TR is, but um, TR says in the chat box, I remember Carol Lone Lea Ford and Virginia Wheeler, owners and the history of the Spoyton Doyville, I don't know if I'm saying that right, restaurant, such terrible loss, loss of history. Mm. Um, TR, would you like to um, say something, ask a question or share? Or yeah, feel free to, to, to share with us about um, those places. I'm gonna unmute you, TR here, or you can unmute yourself. Yes, not. Also, no pressure to talk. If no pressure. To. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I'm going to zoom in. I, I did hear, I did hear someone say oh. something. Oh, great. We have a question. Who is that, please? Uh, Steven. Stephen. Yeah. Deja, I was just wondering, uh, is there any effort to uh, document this in the form of perhaps a film or a book about the lives of um, Black folks in uh, Saratoga Springs and, you know, maybe historical markers for places you know, like Jack's uh, Harlem Club mm -hmm. and other such uh, uh, venues that were so popular uh, we hear about Duke Ellington coming up and staying at the Adelphi. We hear about, oh. um, you know, all, all the illustrious Thelonious Monk, his, his teacher used to come up here and give, you know, piano lessons and, and the like and, and perform. Uh, th there's so much of, of a rich history. Is there any other ways? I mean, what you're doing is incredible. I was wondering if this could turn into a book or a film or, you know, any thoughts about that? Um, I, I'm just going to say I was giggling in the beginning, everyone, because Stephen, who is also a wonderful artist and board member of Black Dimensions in Art, um, one of the oldest um, Black arts organization outside of the city in New York, in uh, New York State, um, Stephen is always encouraging me to um, take these series um to and uh, translate it into a different medium. Uh, so that's why I was giggling when he he asked about a performance. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. 
but I love the way that he's always uh, challenging me um, to think ways in which this work can um, grow and reach more people. Um, so yes, um, the first step for me, which um, I feel like I'm way overdue on since I, uh, you know, mostly created the, the majority of this work in 2011 is a book. Um, because, you know, that's uh, easily accessible to all people. Um, so, you know, that's been on the burner for a long time. I, I need to make moves towards it. But also I'm um, currently thinking about um, monuments and, uh, as Stephen mentioned, historical markers um, in ways that we can incorporate um, not just the people in these photographs, but the larger um, Black history of Saratoga. Mm -hmm. So it, it's in the wheelhouse. Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so there, Miriam has shared um, a website, Black Dimensions. I don't know to make this. It's www dot black dimension in our art dot org is the website oops yeah yeah uh and black dimensions in art um is currently working on our 50th um anniversary celebration which will be in 2023 is that right Stephen? 2023 Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, That's 2025. Okay. Oh, 2025. Okay. Yeah. Um, still, um, no less impressive um, that an organization um, has, you know, st stood that long. And um, you can, do we have an exhibit up right now that people can see? We don't have a current exhibit at the time, but we're working on a number of uh, upcoming uh, art exhibits. Uh, in the capital region. Yeah. Yeah. But they can always go to the website and uh, find updates there. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. And I I would definitely forget to mention this, but um, for those of you local in the capital region, um, another um, portion of a body of my work just opened uh, yesterday at the Albany Center Gallery. And the show is uh, the Mohawk Hudson Regional Invitational, um, which is a three-person show. And the gallery is open um, uh, following COVID um, protocol masks. Um, but it, it is nice to be able to actually go see art in person again. So if anybody uh, is interested in that, you can go to Albany Center Galleries for uh, more details. And what is the address of the Albany Center? Um, is it down I on Mark Street, still. I think it's it on Broadway. I, Broadway. I think it's four eighty eight, but it's uh -huh. definitely Broadway. Okay. I think I hope. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> let's see if there's any. Uh, well, we're gonna wind up here, I think. Um, but um, T. TR is also asking about a book uh, regarding the photographs that you exhibited at the Dance Museum a few years ago. It had a wonderful history on the families of Saratoga. So, um. Yes, I'm, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Hopefully Great. sooner than later. <laughs> Great. Very good. Um, thank you so much, Daisha, for sharing your beautiful photographs with us and and more than that, for just giving us such a, a rich history um, from your personal and a historical perspective. Um, and so with that, we're going to close and we'll give, give you a hand here. I'll unmute everyone. Can we see? Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. You're so Beautiful. good. Great job. Thank you, Daisha. Thank you. Good to see you, Muriel. You too. <laughs>
Yeah, okay. <laughs> <I'll call you. laughs> Bye, everyone. It was a lovely program. Thank Beautiful you so much. Day, yeah.